Good morning. morning. Welcome back to church. Everyone doing well? Okay, please open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 2, 17, and we're going to read all the way up through 3, 5. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, you can follow along uh, using the screens to my right or to my left. If you don't have a Bible at all, we'll get you a Bible. Come and talk to me. Beginning in verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left alone at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. That no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass. And just as you know, for this reason... When I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Amen? Let's just pray real quickly. Father, I pray as we study this text, you enlighten our hearts, you prepare us uh, for what it has to teach us. We pray that your spirit goes out as, um, as we examine the words of Paul and that we are formed and transformed and that we're renewed and that we walk away with a greater appreciation Uh, for the beautiful work of your son at the cross. For all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So uh, a while back, I went to lunch with somebody at El Tarasco. You guys ever been there? And um, we sat down and he ordered like some sort of fajita plate or something. And the waitress said to him, do you want corn or flour tortillas? And he said, and I'm not joking here. He said, what's a tortilla? And I was like, awesome, I'm going to get to hear this waitress explain what a tortilla is. <laughs> I'm not even sure how I would do that. And she was like, it's a flat circle of bread. And I was like, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a pretty good explanation. Uh, it would have been easier just to show them a tortilla. Is that right? Like, what is a tortilla? It's this. Sometimes when we're asked to describe things, we find out that it's easier just to display them. What we have in this passage is not Paul describing what it means to have a pastoral heart. He's displaying his pastoral heart for the congregation that's at Thessalonica. He's not um, telling them, he's showing them. He's kind of bearing his heart to this group of people so they understand who he is and what it means to care for people and to shepherd people and to pastor people. Now, there's a difference between being a pastor in like a technical sense, an elder at a church, and being pastoral. Some people will be pastors, some believers. All believers will be pastoral. All of us are called in different times in our lives and in different locations to act pastorally to other people, even if we never bear the title of pastor. It's an important element, component of Christian faith. I'm sure you in your life have been pastored by someone who is not strictly your pastor. That person's been pastoral for you. If you are a husband, you're called to be pastoral to your wife and your kids. If you're a parent, you're called to be pastoral to your children. All of us have friends and companions here for which we can be pastoral. So like the predominant question for you and for me as I was preparing and studying this text is, do we have pastoral hearts? Don't raise your hands because last night a few people raised their hands and said, yes, I do. I hope that's true for all of us. Paul? is displaying here his pastoral heart, and a pastoral heart is something that is profoundly powerful. Paul is not a powerful guy. He doesn't have an army. He doesn't have a great deal of money. He doesn't have political power. He's not where people are predominantly Jewish, where he might have some social cash. He's out with the Greco-Romans. However, Paul ends up being, aside from Jesus, perhaps the most influential human being in all of human history. The world looks more different today and looks the way it does today because of this Jewish Christian preacher from 2,000 years ago that didn't have an army, that didn't have any money, that didn't have any political influence. And I believe the power that stood behind Paul is first and foremost the message that he preached, that is the message of the gospel, and secondarily how he lived that message out with a pastoral heart. 
People are often not, off, not often forced into change. Has anyone ever forced your heart to change? <laughs> they're convinced sometimes. They're persuaded. But the most powerful way for people to change is to experience someone's heart towards them, to be mentored by somebody. I think back on my uh, many years sitting in church here, and what sticks out to me are not individual lessons or sermons, but the persistent example of the pastors here. And then more, the other more mature believers as they invested in my life and displayed towards me a pastoral, gracious heart. Does that make sense? Just for a more full response. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. I want to zoom out just for a second and provide some context. Is that okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's going to be a long service, so just prepare. (laughs) He spoke everything to existence. He's the supreme creator of all things. There was nothing, and he spoke, and then there was something. And Adam and Eve were his first human creations. They were made in the image of God. They represented God. They walked in the garden with God. And eventually, they violate a command that God gave them. And when they do that, when they eat from the tree at which they were not supposed to eat, death enters the world, and sin enters the world, and human beings are doomed to destruction. They're no longer acceptable to be before a holy God. The wrath of God is meant now to be poured out on sinners. This included Adam and Eve, and this includes anyone who is a descendant of Adam and Eve. It's like the bad news of the gospel. The good news is this. God, in his kindness, sends his son, God himself, taking on human form, walking a perfect, obedient life in our place, and dying a death in our place at the cross, so that the wrath of God might be poured out on our substitute, Jesus Christ. He takes God's wrath. He carries our sin so that we might call on his name and receive his righteousness so that all who call on the name of Jesus might be saved. That's what the gospel is. So that happens, and then after that happens, is everything fine? Is the world completely put back in order? Do bad things still happen today? I think almost everyone would acknowledge that bad things still happen today. We are in a waiting period. We are awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? We are awaiting Christ to come back. And when he does that, that is when he will set everything right. His work for salvation is done. You may not be able to add to it in any way. You will not be able to add to it in any way. I will not be able to add to it. However, his historical work is not done. He's going to return, and he's going to renew heaven and earth. So Paul is speaking to a congregation that in one way is like us, and in many ways is not like us, but they're in the same era. Have you been asked recently, do you think it's the end times? Anyone ever asked you that? The answer is yes, but it has been for 2,000 years. We are in the final age, the final era. So Paul goes into Thessalonica. He's preaching this gospel, this good news of God who has worked to offer redemption to his people. And these people who are not Jewish really don't know much about Judaism, don't study the Old Testament scriptures. They come to have faith in Jesus. And a small church is born in Thessalonica. And then shortly after that, they convince Paul that he needs to leave Thessalonica because there's persecution coming. And he listens to their instruction and he leaves. And after he leaves, people begin to talk trash about Paul. They say, Paul was only interested in your money. He was only interested in some notoriety or fame. He just wanted some followers. And look, at the first sign of trouble, he left. But that's not Paul's actual situation. He was acting in prudence. He left, and he was unable to return. And so he sends Timothy, which we read about here, to get a report from the Thessalonians to find out what's going on with them. And in this little letter, when he recounts for us, almost biographically, what his days and weeks and months were like as he was separated from the Thessalonians, we read about the pastoral heart of Paul, which is meant for us. Every believer can read how Paul behaves here and then begin to live that way. It's powerful. It actually has the power to change people. So we read about Paul's pastoral heart, at least uh, four things. Uh, The first is this, a pastoral heart bonds. Pastoral heart bonds. Read verses 17 through 20 again with me. But since you were torn, since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. Is it not you? For you are our glory glory and joy. Right here we see the words of someone 
who is deeply bonded with a group of people. He's experiencing a great deal of affection for them. The words he uses are some of the most emotional words in the New Testament. The word he uses for like taken away from or torn away from is the word where we get our word orphaned. The loss of a child. And in that day, it also meant the loss of a parent. Paul's saying, I didn't mean for this to happen. It happened to me. I was taken away and I was unable to return. And it's causing me great agony. He's using really intense language to describe how sad he is, how frustrated he is, how tragic he finds it that he can't return to the Thessalonians. He also says that he longs for them or has great desire to be with them. This is a word that in the New Testament, epithumia is the word, it's most often used to refer to extreme passion. He really, really wants to be with them. I think sometimes we read about Paul and his missionary journeys, and we can kind of begin to think that he's like this sort of shrewd manager. He's like managing different satellite churches he set up, building his denomination. <laughs> it's not really what he's doing. He's going to places, he's pouring his heart, heart out for the gospel. People are converted, and he's bonded with these people. He's seen them come to faith. He cares about them, he cares about their future, he wants them to be okay. And in this case, he's separated and cannot return. Paul regularly talks about the churches that he's been involved with in this way. Look at Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Here's another one, 1 Corinthians. Sorry, 2 Corinthians. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Also from Philippians. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I don't think it's a show. I don't think Paul's putting a show on. Uh, Has anyone ever been told by someone, oh, I really, really love you, but they don't act like it? People are afraid to raise their hands. In one sense, Paul's affection, his bond to them is described and is communicated through the way that he talks about him. But I think he means it because his words are not empty. He takes action. He says, I tried. I tried many times to get to you. I I have this um, friend who described to me one time, he was kind of confessing a sort of sin. And he said, many things in my life I don't follow through on. I don't always do the things I say. I let things get in the way of tasks. Anyone ever let things get in the way of tasks? You're like, I'll wait for you to email me and then I'll handle it. Right? <laughs> Ball's in your court. He said, I do that all the time, but when it comes to surfing, I clear the path. And now it may not be surfing for you, but many of us know what sorts of things we really love and how quickly we will clear the path to get there. Paul's like that. He's like, I'm clearing the path. And then we read he was unable to do it. Why? Who stopped him? Satan. Should have tried that. Don't show up to work one day. They're like, why didn't you come? Like, Satan stopped me. He'd have a meeting with HR, like, real quick. They're like, you're going to have to unpack that for us. Uh, This is a weird passage. Uh, Not because Satan doesn't exist. He does, right? It's because it's not clear what he means, right? Some people are like, does it mean that there's so much sin in the church that Paul is ministering to right now that he can't really leave? And and the sin in that church is seen as the work or influence of Satan? Uh, Does it mean maybe that the uh, Thessalonian political powers made it illegal for Paul to return to Thessalonica? And so he politically or legally could not return? Does it mean like he's walking down the road and Satan was like, no, no. Uh, It's not clear. It's not clear. Uh, I do need to pause and do just like a quick Satan sidebar. uh, Just in case you guys want to talk to people about Satan after church. Uh, Satan, and this is going to make people who are new or not believers uncomfortable, Satan is real. Uh, I think we can sometimes believe he's just the metaphor or or illustration or or, uh, allegorical embodiment of evil. Maybe you've heard something like that. Like Satan's just kind of a a literal, a, a, a metaphorical figure. Um, Satan is real. He is to some degree powerful. He's older than the human race. He's the chief adversary of God and his people. And he desires for things to go badly. That's a real thing that I believe and that I want you to believe. 
However, at the same time, I think people uh, can kind of overestimate or, I don't know what the word is, like just become terrified of Satan. Some of you probably hear right now are always afraid of satanic or demonic forces. Uh, listen to what Peter says. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We read this and we think the devil is an actual danger. When I see bad things happen in the world, the first lens that I naturally look through is the lens of human sin. I think human sin caused these evil things. And I think a lot of times that is true. But there's a, like an additional lens that we should be viewing the world through, and that is the power of Satan, demonic forces. Um, but Satan is not an equal of God. It's not like in an arm wrestling match with God, and we'll see who wins in the end. Uh, Peter continues in this very passage, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I think on the one hand, we can become afraid of demonic powers, and I think it's appropriate to consider that they are real and actually active in the world. However, at the same time, uh, God will succeed in his victory in the end. There should be no actual concern with that regard. Then Paul says this. This is an interesting passage. He says, um, for what is our hope or joy or crown of what? Boasting. You don't often hear people say it's good to boast in church, right? Usually in church you hear don't boast. And, and Paul actually says things exactly like that. And in Romans we read this. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works. No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Paul says here, it is not good to boast about one's own salvation because you and I did not earn that salvation. That us being rescued from sin and from death is not our own effort. It's not our own doing, but it's the doing and effort of God himself. It is on God's merit that we're saved, not our own. It doesn't make sense to boast about something that you did not do. God did it. And it's essential that when we think about salvation, the category of boasting is completely removed. So we're reminded we did not do it. God did it. But then there are other places where there seems to be this good type of boasting. Paul says, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die every day. Here's another one. Oh, sorry. So that is written, let the one who boasts, boast in what? The Lord. Okay, another one. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. The point is this. There are places in the New Testament where it seems like Paul is saying that it is appropriate to boast. You follow me on that? It's appropriate to boast only in terms uh, that actually do bring glory to God. Paul is not saying, look at all the great things I have done for God. He's saying, look at all the great things that God has done through me. And ultimately, that brings glory back to God. Everyone still with me on that? Does that make sense? He continues. He says that they are his joy and his glory. They are his hope and his joy. He has all this language about how their joy and their hope is his joy and hope. He's saying that his joy and hope is so tied up in them that if they're not happy, he's not happy. You with me? My kids are taking swimming lessons. Anyone ever done swimming lessons? And I'll be sitting in the bleachers and occasionally a kid that I don't know. I don't know him. I don't know his name. He'll walk up to me and show me like a ribbon he has from passing a swimming test. And I'll have to pretend like it matters at all to me. <laughs> like, oh, good job, young man. Well done. Am I the only one that does that? Everyone just super excited for the achievements of kids they don't know? Or is that? <laughs> I pretend well, to be clear. He has no idea that I don't care. Uh, but then my own kid will show me the same ribbon and say the same thing, and I'll be pretty pumped about it. Because my joy is tied up in my children's joy in a unique and particular way. Does that make sense? And that's not just true for a parent-child relationship. It's true for uh, all kinds of relationships. You have friends that when they succeed, you are genuinely happy for them. And when they mourn, you mourn 
with them. When Paul is bonded to the Thessalonians, and really when he's bonded with any other group of believers he's invested in, his heart rises and falls with them. Pastoral heart bonds, actually bonds to people. It actually ties itself to other people such that what happens to them happens to you. As I was preparing this week and reading this passage and feeling convicted about what it means to be pastoral, I was asking this question, to whom am I bonded? Who in my life that's not blood related to me, do I feel their joy and their suffering? As a church together, we should be rising and falling, not to the depths of despair, but understanding that we do things together. And part of pastoring, part of having a pastoral heart with other members in this church is really bonding yourself to other people and allowing the circumstances of their life to affect the circumstances of your life. So a pastoral heart bonds, pastoral heart also bestows, bestows. In verses 1 through 2 of chapter 3, Paul says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. His bondedness, his bonding with the Thessalonians led to him bestowing things to the Thessalonians. He gave things over to them. He wanted to go himself. He was unable to do that for one reason or another. We know that Satan hindered him, but we don't know specifically what that means. But he was, however, able to send Timothy. And when he sends Timothy, he sends his closest, greatest companion. He's giving the Thessalonians his best. He's not sending like the third tier companion. He's sending Timothy in. Here's what Paul says about Timothy elsewhere. He says, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. He says this, uh, that is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Paul's situation is not always stable. It's not always safe. It's not always secure. One of the weird YouTube rabbit holes I get into are cave exploration disasters. When I can't sleep at night, I watch cave exploration disasters. You might have a suggestion for me, right? Oh, you having trouble sleeping? It blows my mind. Someone sees like a weird crack in a rock. They think, I think I can get my body through that. <laughs> Let's see what's down there. Like, I don't like reaching under the sink. <laughs> and so in these stories, they're crazy, right? Like these guys can barely communicate. They're all over the place. These caves are deep and they're dark. There's weird, gross like bucks down there there's like pitch black cliffs and what will happen is they'll get separated one from two and the two will be close to the exit and this one stuck way further down and uh the one who's closer to the exit will send his buddies like you gotta go check on the other guy and they'll like take the flashlight and they'll take the radio and they'll head down the guy who is now by himself is less secure and safe than he was when he had a partner he's doing it for the sake of the person that's further down in the cave Paul sends Timothy out. He's sending his best. He's sending someone who is his closest companion in ministry. If you've ever done any form of long-term ministry or serious ministry, whether it's here or somewhere else, you know that having a close companion is vital. Having someone who you can rely on, who can hold you accountable, who can care for you, who can encourage you. Paul's sending that guy to the Thessalonians. He is giving over to them his best. He is making an immense sacrifice for the people that he is bonded to. I think there is kind of this epidemic uh, recently, and I'm not saying it's all bad, so just bear with me for a second, like the kind of self-care epidemic. I I think it's good to care for yourself. I think it's good, you know, like take a a rest day. That's fine. Rest days are good. Take a vacation. Um, Have practices that are generally good for you. Uh, But the Bible's main category is not self-care. It's self-denial and self-sacrifice. Paul knows when he sends Timothy, it could mean the end of his own ministry. He's not strictly safe. He sends Timothy away not knowing what the future holds, but he's making a sacrifice for the sake of a group of people to whom he's bonded, whom he loves. Their joy and their hope and their happiness is so bound up in his own that it's worth him sending his closest, best companion. 
So today, to sacrifice means to, to make costly choices for the sake of other people. It could be money, could be time, could be like social cash, could be labor. To see someone in our congregation who is in need and to do something that costs you. Paul doesn't send the third tier companion. He sends Timothy in, his best, to go and care for the Thessalonians. Pastoral heart bonds and it bestows. A pastoral heart uh, builds. I want you to read verses 3 and 4 with me. Uh, Paul says, On that he's sending Timothy to exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. He's giving it to them so that they might grow. He's bestowing to them so that they might be built up. And he's talking about affliction. Anyone here ever been afflicted with anything at all? Just a few of you. Wow, what an what a amazing room. <laughs> Paul's talking maybe about persecution. He had to flee Thessalonica, so maybe the Christians who are still there aren't doing so well. He could mean division. He could mean sickness. He could mean poverty. Uh, One of the ways that early Christians struggled is when they became Christians, they were no longer involved in the various marketplaces that involved idolatry. So some of them lost their ability to do productive trade, and they didn't have as much money uh, and as much ability to care for their families. Could be that. Everyone here, to one degree or another, has been afflicted and will be afflicted. It's a mercy. It's a mercy that we do not know all at once all the bad things that will happen to us. It's a mercy. Paul wants to prepare the Thessalonians for affliction. Suffering is a major category of the New Testament. A major category. All the way back at the very beginning, Jesus talks about suffering this way. talks about persecution this way. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here's John, or Jesus in John. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Here's another one. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 2 Timothy, indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Or James, a a book that we've recently gone through, begins it this way. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I, I read so many passages because I want to emulate for you the way that Paul talks about his preparation for the Thessalonians. He's like, we said it over and over and over again. To be prepared for affliction. To be ready for affliction. To experience the repeated application of God's truth to the facts of life. To be reminded of the good things that God has done and will do. Did you guys know that history ends well? (laughs) Like if you're not doing well one day, go to the end of the book that tells us how things end. And you can be reminded, in the end, God takes his bride. God renews heaven and earth. He undoes all the evil. It ends well, Hope Chapel. (laughs) Have you ever... um, like, looked at the sign on the outside of an elevator. What's on that sign? There's like a weird flame, 
and then a guy walking downstairs. You know what I'm talking about? And what that is telling you is, if there's a fire, don't get in an elevator. Go down the stairs. You guys have all seen that sign before? You all have seen it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. You know what sign, or you know what purpose I bet that sign never actually serves? Is there's a fire, and someone runs to the elevator. The last second they see that sign, they're like, ah, don't get in the elevator, take the stairs, and they take the stairs. The sign is there repeatedly and over and over and over and over again so that when fire breaks out, you know what to do already. Paul wants us to apply the truths of God to our lives so that when we are struck by affliction, we're ready. We're prepared for it. When I was young and I was doing school, I was went to a class here and I was in a science class and I had this experiment that many of you have probably had where you're given an egg and you're told uh, you need to find a way to be able to drop this egg from a six foot ladder and, and then it won't break. You know what I'm talking about? They give you styrofoam and they give you tape and they give you like weird like, you know, uh, like bits of foam and stuff like that. Anyone ever do that? Okay. Uh, I was not a great science guy. <laughs> weird thing to say. Um, but I had a friend named Jacob Tremper, who was a good science guy. And uh, Jacob, like, just wrapped this egg perfectly. I got credit for it, but he wrapped the egg well. And they took it to a six-foot ladder, and they dropped it. And did it break? No, because it also had, like, a, a, a Ralph's bag parachute on top of it. <laughs> And so the teacher's like, all right, let's try, you know, the balcony. Balcony didn't break. Top of the church. Someone walks up there, drops it, doesn't break. And then uh, a young man who was in second place was furious. His name was Michael. Not the Michael you know. Different (laughs) Michael. He, He picked our contraption up with egg, and he threw it as hard as he could. And it didn't even hit the wall. The parachute caught, it stopped, and then just started on the ground. I got some credit for that. I didn't really do that, but I got credit for it. I mean, I think you could probably see the analogy I'm trying to make, the illustration I'm trying to give. uh, There is power in repeatedly applying the word of God to our lives, to remembering what God has achieved through his son, to remember that the spirit is with us now, to remembering that Jesus is returning, to remember that God won't abandon us such that when we are afflicted, no matter how hard Satan picks us up and throws us at a wall, we won't break. Not because we are strong, we're fragile like eggs, but because we're surrounded and protected by the power and the word of God. Let me just say one more thing. Uh, This is the, the best opportunity for us or you, if you've not done this, to practice being pastoral. This is simply and lovingly and casually and regularly reminding other people of the marvelous truths of the Bible. I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've been encouraged and I've been cared for in the midst of affliction by someone who doesn't even know what's going on and just talks a little bit about Jesus to me. Not even someone who's a particularly good speaker or particularly wise, maybe someone that I don't even like very much, no one here, (laughs) just says something to me that's true about God and it's a bomb for my soul when I need it. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. That's free for us to do. It costs us nothing. It's a great way to practice acting pastorally. Pastoral heart bonds, it bestows, it builds, and it bears. Uh, 3-5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Paul bears the burden of souls. And what I mean by this is he is concerned about the state of the souls to those whom he ministered. He cares about their holiness. And he cares about their salvation. Now, I want to be clear. This is important. Uh, If God starts a work in you, he's going to finish it. Every time, without exception. God doesn't fail in his plans. He doesn't fumble 
his tasks, people don't slip through his fingers. If God has you, he will not lose you. That's an important truth to rest in. However, at the same time, we don't know who that is and is not true for. Over and over again in the Bible, we're given warnings to practice obedience, and we're given warnings to care for other members of our churches such that they might continue to practice obedience. Because in the New Testament, the only outward sign of faith is obedience. It's not how loud you sing in church, sing as loud as you want. It's not how good you feel about Jesus. It's not how much you know about the Bible. All those things might be good. Obedience. Paul has a burden. He has a fear that he would leave and then the tempter, Satan, would tempt some of those who are there and he'd lose them. He has a burden for souls. We're responsible for each other's holiness. I don't mean that we're constantly walking around trying to call each other out. Not just one big gotcha session. It means we lock arms and we lovingly seek to be obedient together all the way to the end. Sometimes that will be a hard conversation. Oftentimes it will simply be companionship and encouragement. I was at one of my kids' soccer games recently and I... You know this, like one parent watches a few quarters and the other one goes to like the nearby playground with the other younger kids. Anyone ever do that? And so I go over there and I got my two younger kids on the playground. And then parents do this thing where they like walk up with their kids. And they kind of see that I'm there. And they just start slowly making space between them and their own kids. They're like, you got this, right? I walk away. I don't think I look like a babysitter at all. But I got like... 15 kids there in like eight minutes. I'm running like soccer daycare. (laughs) And so then like, I feel the burden of having a bunch of kids outside of this soccer field on this playground. Like, you know, this kid's on the slide, but not on the slide, on top of the slide. needs to get on, you know, and like this kid's eating sand. Uh, She wants to go on the the monkey bars, but she's like two and a half and can't do that. And she's going to break her leg. And I'm concerned about that. I'm like feeling a burden. Does that make sense? Feeling a burden. Uh, There's another preacher that when he preaches this passage, he's like, I imagine Paul was pouring his life out, carrying the burden of other people's souls, meaning desiring for them to be saved and cared for and discipled and mentored all the way to the end. And he's going to pour every last drop out. And then when he gets to heaven, he's going to take a million year nap. (laughs) (laughs) I want us to feel a burden for each other. I don't want it to be a crushing burden. I don't want it to be an immense panic. I don't want us to be running around terrified all the time. But I want us to feel a burden for each other, for each other's holiness, that we might, in obedience, all the way to the end. Paul's showing us here that um, being a pastor and being pastoral is not just simply uh, like teaching people. It is that. It's part of it. It's bonding yourselves to people. It's giving to them. It's seeking to build them up either formally or informally. And it is carrying the burden of their soul. Meaning you deeply and affectionately care for this person's eternal future. Paul is not interested in their temporary happiness. He's not. He's not interested in their temporary joy. He is interested in their everlasting joy. He's interested in the end. When Christ returns and all things are made new, that they will have their reward then. And he'll give everything up, pointed in the direction of those efforts. Amen? May our lives be the same sort of drink offering for each other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this morning and your word. We thank you for the example of Paul. We thank you for the many ways that you've blessed us. We pray as we take communion together now, that we would consider the greatness of your son, the victory he had at the cross, that we remember that you will never leave us or forsake us. Pray these things in his name. Amen.